Unchained Women, K.R. Mira and Rachel Morin on how stories questioning stereotypes, absolutely how, how stories questioning stereotypes can empower women, the reader and the writer in conversation with Shaman Das. The first person to speak. Um, two very different uh, women. Uh, K.R. Mira's uh, novel, Hang Woman, with the subtitle, Everybody Loves a Good Hanging. I loved it when I read it. It's set in Kolkata, has Bengali characters, was originally written in Malayalam, and wonderfully translated by J. Devika into English. Uh, Rachel Moran, uh, whose book Paid For has created waves and uh, who's a very, very powerful uh, speaker against what is called the sex trade. I'm not even sure whether you'd like it to be called the sex trade. It's, you know, trafficking of women. And uh, she has been in the forefront of a campaign in Ireland to introduce what's called the Nordic model. And perhaps I will begin by asking Rachel to tell us a little bit about the Nordic model because we don't really know much about it. And there has been a very large debate as to whether prostitution or the sex trade should be legalized, what are the safeguards that uh, workers in the sex trade should have, whether their clients or their johns, as they're called, what should happen to them. So perhaps you'd like to kick off by talking about the Nordic model. Thank you very much, and thank you, everybody, for coming here to listen to us today. Um, I work with a group called Space International, and we have members from across seven nations. Um, our main goal is to promote the Nordic model across these nations and further beyond in the world. The Nordic model is uh, the only social justice framework of dealing with prostitution uh, anywhere on this earth. What it does is it criminalizes exploiters, be they um, punters, as we call them in Ireland, Johns, as they're known in the United States, um, pimps, traffickers, anybody who's exploiting um, a woman, a child, a person of any stripe in prostitution, be it sexually or financially, this model criminalizes them. At the same time, it decriminalizes the exploited I think that this is perfectly um, bald obvious, really. That's what we ought to be doing. And it's just not done um, in most of the nations on the earth. So that's what we're all about. We're about pushing that model. The third element of the model, and it's equally as important as the other two, is the provision of exit strategies. That is real viable help with housing, with childcare, with counseling, education and training and so forth in order to open up avenues um, through which women in the sex trade can start real, um, fruitful lives. Yes, uh, thank you for that uh, brief and succinct explanation of the Nordic model. I now turn to uh, K.R. Mira, uh, how many of you here have read Hangwoman or have, have heard about it? Okay, right, uh, very few. Uh, for the others, I'd strongly recommend it, uh, not because I'm getting paid anything by Penguin to do so, but because it is simply one of the most extraordinary novels about Kolkata and has as its center this uh, really remarkable woman uh, who becomes in the novel uh, potentially the first female hangwoman in, in India, and uh, she's called Chetona, conscience as well. Uh, what I found uh, amazing about this is that I can't think of a recent novel written in English or Bangla about Kolkata that captures the city so well, and which has such a powerful female protagonist. And uh, I think I'll ask uh, Mira to Tell us a little bit about what made her write, in, write this novel and what makes her, you know, uh, create such a woman. Does she hope to achieve anything by, uh, by the Gritha Mollik daughter? Uh, and then we can maybe try and link these two apparently very disparate uh, positions together with your help. Thank you very much, Samantakaji. First, uh, 
I wish to thank uh, Rachel for her wonderful work. And uh, it's so, dip, so disturbing to read. And, but I found two quotations uh, given in the beginning of uh, two chapters uh, quite insightful. The first is that you all know, you all, we all have a specific individual history and what why what we did and that explains why we did what we did and the other is that we know our world through our relation to it well while writing hang woman i wanted to tell the world that we do have a specific history an individual history and not only that but a national history too a national emotional history for women as a whole. Looking back or looking into my writing career, though I had started writing at a very early age, I had stopped it in my early te late teens because at that time Malayalam literature was very vibrant with a, with a handful of very talented writers writing vigorously, prolifically. And I felt that I don't have anything more to contribute to that. There was nothing new to talk about. Everyone was first talking about all the major issues. But as I grew old, as I became, as I graduated, as I passed my um, uh, post-graduation and I started working, I found that there are some stories I wish to read, but nobody was writing them. Those stories actually, the stories we, I read at that time were all about women who were crying, who were good mothers, very good sisters, and very lovely lovers. And there were no angry women. There were no women who could take, dream of taking revenge. There were no many women, no women at all who wants, want to wield power. So we all wanted women to sacrifice their lives and make others happy rather than being happy. So I thought, I'm going to write about women who will laugh and laugh at men. Once in a while, we all need a change, no? So when I thought of uh, writing about Chetana, Chetana is the protagonist of this novel. I named her Chetana because she epitomizes my Chetana, the spirit, the essence of her spirit. So she is the one who is not afraid of power. He knows the difference between being political and apolitical. She knows how, she's, how people manipulate life, society, rules. And she realizes that when people victimize others, victimize others, they are also being victimized in a way. So when you say that women are the victims of a particular gender value system, I want to tell the world that even men are also being big victims at the same way, in a different way, to the same system. So that's how I thought of writing this novel. And I made her a hangman, and that too, the very first hangman in independent India for a very specific reason. Because as we all know, after independence in India, women, women were handed over social empowerment. What we call empowerment today is just social empowerment. The political empowerment is a quite different thing. By political empowerment, I mean the power to kill. You can't imagine a woman to be a killer. Someone kills, someone orders to kill. And who is this hangman? What's the post of hangman signify? 
in the hierarchy of power, the job of the hangman is the last step where the order to kill is executed. And what will happen in independent India after six decades, six, uh, about seven decades of independence, a woman steps onto that step. I was just curious to know. And that's how I wrote this. I wrote this, of course, with the politics. I wanted to question the politics which is prevailing in India. Thank you, Meera. Uh, there are several things which, which bind the, the narratives that are emerging from Meera and, and Rachel. Uh, one of which has to do with the power of media. Uh, one of the things that occurs in your novel is, is, is the power of this media, you know, this intrusive television which comes in. And the fact that Rachel has been attacked in several media, in, uh, you know, in the blogosphere, in social media, on television, for what she has said after having been trafficked at the age of 14. Uh, I want to ask you as to how media shapes the narratives which tell us what we should do or we should not do? How, how strong is media now, in, not just in Ireland, but in the particular realm of work with which you are concerned? Thank you. Well, what we are facing in the global abolitionist movement is um, an absolute tsunami of propaganda. And of course, it's funneled and channeled through various forms of media. Um, and in this day and age, uh, a good deal of it is through social media. I lost count a long time ago of the amount of times I've been libeled and slandered. I, it's into the thousands now at this point. And uh, a good deal of it is through social media. And I laugh with my, my friends and say, I just want some of it to land up in the mainstream press because then I'll be able to take a claim and f get some compensation out of this. Because it is so relentless. You know, the lies that are told about me are quite shocking. You'd be amazed at some of the things I've been accused of. And speaking of murder and death, I've been accused of being a murderer. It's gone all the, all the way to, um, you know, truly bizarre proportions. But I think our problem doesn't stop there. Um, we have a great deal of propaganda coming out of the universities which is truly disturbing because if you look at the women's studies or as they're almost always now have been renamed gender studies, apparently there was something wrong with women's studies. Um, but if you, you look at these courses, we are consistently peddled the lie that prostitution is sex work, um, that uh, disempowerment can be empowering, um, that there's such a thing as the right uh, to be unfree and so on and so forth. And what I feel we're really facing now is an Orwellian, uh, Alice in Wonderland um, style future that is so consistent with the, um, the concept of the book 1984 that it's truly disturbing. So it's, the media is one part of that. It seems to operate in a circle. I find what's coming out of the universities um, amongst the most damaging because it's uh, polluting not only young minds, but the young minds that are going to be the leaders of the future. Thank you. Um, I was wondering after I read your book and uh, did you face any kind of reaction, you know, being a woman writing about this powerful woman who actually knows how to make a not while she's in her mother's womb, and, and what she does. I, won't, I don't want to give the story away because it's also a fantastic story. But you have this, this woman, otherwise pretty, gentle, quiet, and yet who wants to become a hangwoman, and how she deals with the man who basically exploits her horribly. Uh, did you face any kind of reaction? Not from the general reading public. While I was writing this, actually, I had expected women to like this story and that to a very small section of the women because the story contains so grim and gloomy stories, so much of uh, death and uh, kind of death but, and death but and But it's death. also very funny. That's, that's the other part. You know, it's, it's also a very, very funny story because Chetna has this ability to not only laugh at herself, but her father, who's this you know, old person, 
and it'll be familiar to people in Kolkata because this is basically a retelling of the Nata Mollik, Dhananjoy, Hetal Parekh case. Uh, Hetal is almost absent, but it's, it's Dhananjoy, and if Dhananjoy had a, uh, you, you know, I mean, Nata Mollik had a daughter, what would, what would she be like? I mean, she's telling us this in, 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 in Kolkata. It's, it's also very funny. I was not trying to be funny, in fact. I, I, I was trying to be sarcastic. Okay. It's, it's <laughs> I was trying to be making fun of, in yes, fact. Yeah. So, uh, when I wrote this, I never expected, I, say, I was saying, I expected uh, that men are also not going to like this because there was a lot of criticism, sharp attack against them. But I was really surprised when young readers male readers between age between 25 and 50 or 45, they told me that it helped them to look at life and women and themselves in a very different angle. So in the novel, when my protagonist tells her lover or the man she wants to love, but uh, I don't want to talk about that. but. She says, she repeats his, his sentence that I would like to experience the exact translation for the word in Malayalam. In Malayalam it is written, That is a usage, but it's translated that, I do want to fuck you hard if only once. So, this kind of reaction from a woman I was not sure how uh, it would be welcomed, but I'm so happy that many of the readers had remarked that, setting aside, putting aside the story, the main thread of the uh, novel, what happens in the story is that the patriarchy is being hanged. And I'm so happy that it came from young male readers. Thank you. Uh, the title of this session is Unchained Women, but I think what we are coming back to is the fact that there's this a long way to go before women really can be, be unchained. And uh, I have not read your book, I apologize. Uh, but I, I've, I've read pretty much everything that you've written in your blog and in elsewhere. Uh, Rachel also has a wonderful sense of humor and sarcasm and puts down men who try and defend, you know, this Time Magazine chap who defended his, his going to uh, sex work, well, prostitutes, and uh, I was in a bit of a quandary before I came here, you know, what is, what would be the right word to use, because part of what has happened to, to our generation of men, I think, is that we've been told that prostitution is work like any other work, and so it's sex work, and there are rights for prostitutes, and there are actually bodies of women who are formerly or presently uh, within sex work, and we've been uh, trained, taught, indoctrinated in that way, and to read your take on it is very different, difficult, refreshing also. Uh, but I, I wanted to ask you, what role do you envisage men playing? Because there are, in, in this novel, as well as in Rachel's work, uh, there are also positive figures, male figures who are there. Not, not, not many of them, perhaps. And, and I think the, the other thing that comes through I remember one, one little bit that you've got about watching this man supporting his daughter as she's, she's walking and how that sort of really, you know, broke your heart in a sense. Uh, they are not anti-men. Uh, this, I think, is the, the other thing which, which, which comes through in, in, in both your works. So I, I would like you to comment on where do you envisage the role of men because so many of them have actually attacked you or defended prostitution or have called, including amnesty, calling for uh, legalizing uh, prostitution. First of all, I'd just like to say a few quick words about language and explain why I oppose the terms uh, both uh, sex worker and prostitute. Um, sex, work, uh, sex worker, of course, shouldn't be used because in order for a person to be a sex worker, there must be a such thing as sex work, which there isn't. Um, sex work is a lie and a ruse because prostitution is not, uh, doesn't concern itself with either sex or work. What prostitution is, is remunerated sexual violation. Um, it's the sale of sexual access to a person's body. 
sex, you have to understand, is beyond the laws of commerce. You can't buy it and you can't sell it. Because what sex actually is, is a natural uh, physical act that happens between two people on the back of arousal. So you can't frame uh, the sale of sexual access to your body as sex. If you remove uh, mutuality from a sexual encounter, what you're left with is not sex. It's compensated sexual violation. So I don't um, use that language of sex work for that reason, but also because uh, it was first coined by, the, uh, by pimps in San Francisco of the 1980s, and it was coined in order to remove uh, the nature of prostitution from the language. So those are two really crucial reasons why I, I don't use that terminology. Um, also, prostitute. I always, sensed, I always sensed the unfairness of the term, but I never looked deeply enough into it. I, I didn't think deeply on it. Um, while I was in prostitution myself, I used it to refer to myself and the other women and um, a whole lot of other lingo besides, which was um, a lot more vulgar. We all did that. But I never really broke down the term prostitute and looked into what it was exactly about it that was unfair. Um, in recent years, I finally came to discover through my involvement in the abolitionist movement what it was that always bothered me about the term. I always knew prostitution to be a compensated human rights violation. I knew that. Um, so it was a revelation to me to have somebody point out, and it was actually a human rights lawyer, <coughs> excuse me, who pointed out to me that if you were to, um, that the, the term prostitute is the only term in uh, the English language that actually confers upon the victim of a crime the essence of the crime. And it is the equivalent of, let's say you had your house burgled and you were to be termed a robitute. And then the penny really dropped and I thought, oh my God, that's why. You know when you object to a term, um, there's something about that term that bothers you and although I didn't know what it was I knew it had something to do with unfairness I knew it was unfair and that's why when it was explained to me in that way the penny dropped and I thought yeah that's why I always felt that it was unfair um, so to get back to your question about men's role in all of this I have to say and it's a strange thing to be able to say and I never would have seen it coming that my view of men, my faith in men, has been more deeply damaged by the behavior of men that I've run up against in recent years um, and their attitudes. And I'm talking about men who don't buy sexual access to women's bodies, but rather sit back, observe it, and defend it. Because at least if a man is buying his way inside women's bodies, you can see why he's defending it. He's defending it. Sexual payoff. He's defending his own interests, regardless how sick they may be. There is a logic in what it is that he's saying. But men who have no, uh, no direct um, payoff here, but sit back with this smug confident ignorance and tell me who spent seven years in prostitution from I was a young teenager that prostitution is only another form of work and we all should just shut up and go home that has hurt me much more deeply than men who, who, who buy to use women in prostitution so as to what men's role here is men's role here is to really look at this situation understand that the earth it consists of two different types of, of people on a biological level, and that one type, males, are destroying the other type, females, in great numbers on account of their sex. And men's role here is to step up and accept that and start having conversations among themselves to each other about how wrongful what's happening here is and how and why it needs to stop. What role do you envisage for, for men? I mean, after you, you've written this powerful 
book, I suppose one could call it a feminist text. Um, yeah, uh, as a writer, I find the man-woman relationship a very good, very useful metaphor to describe any form of discrimination. Because in the context we live and work, man has become an attitude and woman is a condition. Using this, actually, we can explain any form of oppression, suppression, fascism, anything. It's a very useful metaphor. It, isn't, it doesn't imply that all men are bad or all men are fascists or oppressors. But using this, we can easily picture or easily demonstrate how a certain mentality is feeding on people weaker than themselves. And uh, Chetana in this novel says that I can forgive greed or even lust, but not that ravishing eye bent on conquest. I have used the word athishatam in Malayalam. That's not just dominance. That's a violent, aggressive dominance. So that's what that's how I wanted to I wanted to uh, explain in this novel. Thank you. Uh, I can see lots of questions sort of hovering in the audience. So without sort of Further ado, shall we, shall we start taking questions from the audience? Because I think this is a session which needs interaction much more than many of the others. Ruchi Rehbe. Yeah. I'm going to repeat the questions, if that's fine. Okay. The first question was about language, and I was asked um, what language do I think uh, is appropriate in these circumstances. I used the phrase prostituted woman or women in prostitution. Um, I think the phrase prostituted woman is uh, most um, suitable here because what it does is it brings the perpetrator into the picture. Um, a woman cannot be prostituted unless someone is prostituting her. So what this language does is it puts the exploiter back in the frame for the first time in, in, uh, in history, really. And, you know, a funny little story about that. I was actually sitting on my bed thinking and writing and finishing off editing my book when the term prostituter popped into my mind. And I thought, prostituter, someone needs to invent that word I said, okay, I'll do it, no one else is doing it. So I put it in my book, and when I showed a friend of mine in the feminist movement the book to have a read through, um, I laughingly told her that I had invented the word prostituter, and she said, Rachel, that already is a word. I said, you're joking. So I got out the dictionary, and sure enough, there was the term prostituter. So I said, so how in the hell have we never heard the word? I've never heard that word. I've heard prostitute a million times. You know, it's been slung at me often enough, and I've, I've come across it in every form of media and entertainment, etc. But we don't use this word that already exists and has done for God knows how long. So that's another phrase I think we need to incorporate into our lingo. Um, the other question was Amnesty International, the human rights organization that we all recognize. They made a decision in Dublin, my city, in August of last year where they voted um, by majority decision to uh, endorse the decriminalization of pimps and sex buyers and brothel keepers all over the earth. So I'm back to the 1984 kind of um, you know, uh, frame of mind here. It, 
the only good thing that came out of that decision was that it galvanized the women's rights movement like nothing I have ever seen. And women I know who've been involved in this work for many decades longer than I have been all say the same thing. The, the kickback that Amnesty got was absolutely ferocious. And if they think that they're going to sell women down to Swanee like that, they have another thing coming to them. What I feel is that um, this, and this um, links back to the point you just made, this simply would not happen if it were an issue that related to the wholesale violation of tens of millions of men. It wouldn't happen. Amnesty would never have made that decision. And so I absolutely agree with you. The framework of male over female domination, um, a feminist have been telling us for decades, and they're absolutely right, is the original framework upon which all forms of domination were built. The microphone will, will have to be quickly brought because there are lots of questions. Is someone from Kalam who's handling the microphone? Uh, lady there, then the gentleman here, lady. Uh, I have a question. Oh. It's about, because we are talking about stereotypes and sexual violence. So uh, the situations have happened before that when a male is hitting a female on the road, people come and save the female. Whereas when a female is hitting a man on the road, nobody bats an eye, people mock the man. Why is it so? I mean, I would want you to throw some light on it. Who do you want the light to be thrown by? Her or <laughs> Ms. Maybe Rachel. we'll both take it, will we? Yes. Okay. Um, well, first of all, what people, what, what you've just described there is actually an upshot or a consequence of patriarchy. And what I find very amusing is when people look at these upshots and consequences of patriarchy, when they adversely affect the male, they actually take the consequences of, of patriarchy as evidence that patriarchy doesn't exist. So we're back down the rabbit hole again. Um, the reason why men in the country I come from, um, in, in, uh, traditionally in the courts, the courts always favoured the woman um, in, in cases of child custody. And this was taken by men's rights activists as evidence that there was no such thing as male over female domination. They never, of course, stopped to think that it's because men decided women's role was in the home minding the kids in the first place that this situation had developed and evolved. So that exactly reflects the situations you're talking about. And it is, by the way, precisely the absolute tsunami of male on female um, domestic violence and violence in all, all other spheres, that um, it is the, the, the very preponderance of that that has people finally looking at it and saying, okay, well, there's something wrong if you're beating the hell out of your wife. A woman giving a man a slap in the face is comical because, first of all, or it's considered to be comical, rather, because we almost never see it. We, we both have to. Well, in my novel I have written, we all need somebody, somebody's death to leave the imprints of power. So by death, actually, I meant not only deaths. We all need somebody's focus. death. Death could be death of Chetana also, the spirit. And I think this way, by killing someone's Chetana, by killing someone's spirits, so many of us are trying to leave the imprints of power. Thank you. Yes, finally. Good afternoon. I was thinking of a slightly different context. In the context of prostitution, I think the Western view and the Eastern views are different. Because India has always had this tradition of Devdasis and Notch Girls and uh, Mujras in our films and things. So I just wanted a perspective on that. Is someone in India just turning a Nelson's eye or something to all this because it is kind of accepted in our society? And you're talking from a Western perspective. The thought just occurred to me. Okay, can we take maybe three questions and then have the responses because there are lots of questions. Gentlemen here. Thank you. This is addressed to Ms. Moran. Uh, you, with your experience, you talk about decriminalizing the prostitutes and uh, I th you want uh, law to uh, you know, be enforced in India also so that 
prostitutes, the victims are not uh, criminalized. But what about those who run the organizations, those who are in this e evil trade, you know, those who are kidnapping young girls from different parts of uh, the world or India, and they are criminals, you have to admit that. May I have your uh, yeah. say on this, please? Can, can we have the third question from here? Um, oh, oh, the lady here and then. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, hello. I just want to ask you that since you've been here, you must have visited some, you know, uh, people here, have spoken to somebody, some organizations. What is your take on that? Okay. Can you tell us something? And the fourth question and then we'll have the, have the responses. Well, this is to you, Rachel. <coughs> I'm not very sure. But probably have you noticed uh, since the 1990s, because that's also the era of the global uh, economic liberalization, uh, that the very nature of the act of perpetration and the act of, uh, and, and the perpetrated, uh, this very act of perpetrating has changed in any, any accord. Is there a pattern that we can clearly discern that has changed over the years since the 1990s. Okay. I would say that that battle has actually been going on since the 1970s, but it would have certainly picked up more speed and more steam in the 90s, and uh, the internet had a very great deal to do with that. There have been a good few questions, so I want to try and... This one was on the difference between Western and... Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah. My view on that is that prostitution is, uh, prostitution is always framed as an industry. It's only framed as an industry because we're living in a capital world, a capitalist um, society, in, regardless where we live. Um, I always frame prostitution as an institution. Capitalism is only the mechanism through which it, it's processed in these modern times. And I wouldn't care, we have to uh, strip this back to its basic building blocks and really look at what it is. Because I have visited, as this lady here asked, I visited the red light districts here in Calcutta as I have done in many countries across the globe. What I see is the same pain, the same violation, the same exploitation. Um, and what was going on historically two, three thousand years ago, what the origins of that were in any nation. I think that really um, what we need to be looking at is what's happening in the here and now. Because when I was walking through those red light streets, I have to tell you, and I don't want to be offensive, it would never cross my mind to want to come to a nation and to offend people. Especially, and I've really enjoyed the last five or six days I've been here and I've met so many wonderful people. I have to say Calcutta is one of my favorite spots I visited just because of the people. But that red light district, I think it's pronounced Sanjanati. Yeah, Sonagachi. That is an absolute hellhole. And I think that the people of Calcutta need to wipe that district and every other district out of existence because what's going on down there is pure evil, regardless what the origins were many moons ago. Oh yes, that, that re I'm glad you brought that up because I want to really clarify. I said earlier on, and you mustn't have heard me, that the law, that the model that we're pushing for criminalizes the exploiters, be it financial or sexual. So that, of course, includes traffickers, pimps, brothel keepers, all of those people. If you Google Nordic model, you'll get the details of how it first started in Sweden and what happened and so on and so on. And Ireland has taken the first steps towards adopt. You're almost there. Okay, good for you. Great. Okay. One there, lady at the back, gentleman in front. Okay, so what happens in India, what commonly happens in India is mostly the prostitutes are uh, young women or older women and children basically who are kidnapped or uh, taken up from the slums and forced into prostitution. There comes a question of will, if they are willing to come into the institution called prostitution or they are forced, in, forced into it. So when prostitution gets legalized, what do you think the consequences will be? So we'll take, take two more questions. Uh, there's a lady at the back there who wanted to ask a question, gentlemen. She's already asked your question, splendid. Could we have? 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Namaskaram, Meera, ma'am. This question is particularly directed to your book, Arachar or Hangwoman. Ma'am, as a reader, while I was reading it, I felt that a lot of people could not really associate with Chetana because as much as there was a part of her that, as you said, despised the behavior of Sanjeev Kumar Mitra, still there was a part which fiercely loved him. Now, that conflicting character is not something which a reader could easily associate to because people always choose an easy way. I either love you or I hate you. Now, that conflicting character which, was, which came across till half of the book very clearly in her words and actions and feelings was, was something which I think it was hard to portray as well and much harder for a reader to write and understand what was the thought process. So why do you think you chose, such a, uh, uh, chose that angle from her character? Okay, we'll, we'll have Rachel answer her question first and then, then Mira. Your question was about legalization um, and specifically what would happen if it was implemented here. I'll give you some examples from around the world uh, that I have seen firsthand with my own eyes about what has happened um, in every other nation where legalization was implemented. And there's absolutely no reason to imagine that legalization would operate here in any different way. Um, in Germany, I saw signs up in the streets uh, of Munich, uh, a woman, a beer and a blood sausage being sold together in lunchtime package deals so that in the hour that men are out on their lunch break, they can buy sexual access to the body of a woman or a girl and wrap it up with a, a beer and a hot dog on the way back to the office or wherever else they work. Um, there are uh, brothels up to 12 stories high. The largest brothel in Germany is 12 stories high. That's in Cologne. It's called the Paschke. And they have different floors. Um, they have different specialities, rather, on each floor. The, you've got the trans women's floor. You've got the pregnant women's floor. You've got the gangbang floor. Um, it is an absolute horror show. The same thing now is replicating itself all over the place. There's 500 brothels in Berlin alone. In 2012, there was a legislative change in Germany that uh, saw prostitution run out of all control. There are now 450,000 young women and girls prostituting in the brothels of Germany. The women that I work with in Bulgaria and Hungary and Romania, the activists from those regions, they tell me that there are whole villages in those countries where you won't find a woman between the ages of about 15 and 40 years old because they're all prostituting in the brothels of Germany. Now we need to be really looking deeply into this. Apart from the damage and the harm in the here and now, which should be enough, that should be well enough on its own. I wonder, has it not occurred to the German people that they're also sown the, the seeds of historical hatred? Do they not understand that, it, that the people of Hungary and these um, former Soviet bloc countries in their desperate poverty are put in a situation where their women and girls have no viable choice but the prostitute in Germany? That is not something that the people of those nations are going to forget. I'm very serious when I say they're sown the seeds of historical hatred, and I think they're going to pay for it. And I really am quite certain that India doesn't want to set itself up for a situation like that because there are a lot of poor countries in this region of the world. Can you imagine young women who are already coming in here, by the way, from, from places like Bangladesh? Can you imagine the absolute flood into India if you legalized? Because a little known fact about legalization is that what rises immediately with legalized prostitution is illegal prostitution. That's unregulated brothels all over the place where typically underage girls are prostituted in, flooded. <laughs> the traffickers are bringing the girls in by the truckloads. What happens when you legalize is that the demand for paid sex rises exponentially. It's riven at a all control in Amsterdam with the result that the mayor of Amsterdam has been closing the red light districts. Half the red light districts in Amsterdam are shut down now because in his own words he said they were a hotbed of organized crime. I could sit here for an hour telling you about the damage and, and the harm uh, to a nation of legalization and I would strongly advise every person in this room to fight tooth and nail against that unless you want to be living in an open Sespe, some years from now. Thank you. And uh, Mira, your question about, specifically about your novel. Yeah, this was a question uh, which I am faced with on many occasions. 
uh, Oscar Wilde has uh, remarked once that children start loving their parents. After a while, they start judging them and never, if they ever do, forgive them. I think that this is true with the case of man-woman relationship also. We all start loving someone and without being a caterpillar, how can one be a butterfly? Before moving on to the pupa stage, pupal stage, you have to be a caterpillar once. You have to experience that too. And in the case of the evolution of the emotional evolution of a woman, love and romance is an inevitable part. So Chaitanya had to travel, had to complete her journey, had to evolve by experiencing all these things. And another thing is that Sanjeev Kumar Mitra is kind of a representative of the media, another world, a new world for her. She sees her, him as a savior. And she was all ready to consider him as someone superior to him. He was uh, kind of, she was ready to worship him, to respect him. But in the end, or after a while, she realizes that there is no man who can command or demand respect, devotion. There's no man who could be a god. And so it's her journey, it's her uh, search or exploration for herself that she falls in love. Thank you. Lady here. Um, I want to direct this at you, uh, Miraji. Um, I really love this concept about death of Chetna is death. And I think with prostitution or most women, um, that is what happens. But it also reflects that men also have the same thing happen to them. I mean, when a man goes to a prostitute the way you were uh, sending shivers down my whole body, my 12-year-old daughter sitting there hearing all this. And she also wrote a novel called Chetra with the protagonist being Chetra. So um, anyway, but I think when a man does that, his Chetna, his consciousness is already dead. I mean, what she's saying, you know, you eat a bratwurst and a beer and a woman at the same time. and. So I just, I, I was wondering whether you could comment a little bit more. Unfortunately, I started reading a book, but it was taken, given away to somebody, so I didn't finish. So um, would you like to comment on that, if both of you actually, about the what death of... What happens to your conscience or Chetana? Um, man's conscience is already dead when he goes to a prostitute. But. While writing this novel, actually, I had to study a bit about prostitution too. For one reason, because the backdrop was Kolkata. And as we all know, there are about 13 or 14 red light area here. And while reading, I found uh, an interesting uh, uh, reference that during Durga Puja, to make uh, the first idol, the soil from the doorstep of the prostitute is taken. So I was wondering why they are doing this. And I had to search and I think I, re I remember correctly it is from Sumanda Banerjee's book that I got the answer that the man who crosses the doorstep of the prostitute there unravels his ego. So it's the ego of the man is unveiled there. It falls down there at the doorstep of the prostitute. So he is crossing that threshold for his ultimate destruction or giving up or whatever. So the male ego is on the uh, falls down or it remains at the doorstep of the prostitute. And I thought this is a very beautiful, very uh, kind of a concept with more than 
two or three dimensions. In many ways, you can explain that. And so, in the end, I have used this too in the novel. Um, I'd be very interested, by the way, to to have that um, translation written down at the, w before I leave. Um, you know, there are a couple of different things I'll say I could say about this, and I'll just make it brief. Um, first of all, of course, prostitution damages men who buy sexual access to women's bodies. Um, you made a wonderful remark earlier on that I fully agree with and that I have said uh, myself in public numerous times and I've actually gotten it in the neck for saying it from some of the feminists that I organize with. Um, I had one particular woman very angry when I said that, uh, that men are damaged through the purchase of sexual access to women's bodies, but they are. They are damaged mentally and emotionally and spiritually. I have seen it, I have felt it, I've been in those rooms, I've felt that lowness of spirit. For sure, it damages men. And my personal belief is that because of the, uh, as I've written elsewhere, because of the interconnected nature of humanity, it's not possible to hurt each other without hurting ourselves. It's not possible for a people, one people over another. It's not possible on the individual level. It's not possible at all. And that's why I regard prostitution alongside being a desperate, misogynistic, harmful practice that primarily harms women. But I also regard it as a social pollutant and something that harms us all. Thank you. Okay, one last question. Uh, named uh, K. Nair, Shankar Nair. Uh, incidentally, it's about the law. Now, in the UK, sex trade is although legalized, but uh, you may be penalized for soliciting. Now, my question is, how in the court of law can you uh, prove this, unless it's recorded live or not? Uh, t uh, video or camera or something. And number two, the law across the border, that is, uh, you're from uh, Dublin, so uh, it is uh, the Republi uh, Republic of uh, Ireland, isn't it? So uh, what is the law out there? Soliciting is uh, prohibited, although it's... Uh, the pims, the brothels, blah, 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 they all decriminalize, but uh, on the pay, uh, sidewalk, if you approach a woman, will it uh, tantamount to um, soliciting? That's my question. Yeah. Thank you. There's an extraordinary complexity of laws all across Europe, um, in Western Europe, where I'm from. In uh, Northern Ireland, uh, they have just implemented the Nordic model six months ago, and in the Republic of Ireland, where I'm from, they made the decision only within these recent past few days that they'll be doing the same thing themselves very shortly. So we've scored a massive victory after five hard years of campaign, and I'm most glad to say so. So thank you all. Uh, and I think we will all go back with uh, things to think about about our personal, public, and sexual selves. So thank you very much, Rachel. Thanks, Mira. Thank you.